The Magician's Tea Party, Part 2 Come on, called Eyebright. We'll find the boat and follow the river down to the sea. She plunged into the wood as she spoke and threaded her way through the slender young trees, with his majesty close at her heels. Sometimes the bracken was as tall as she was, but the boy behind could always see the sunbonnet bobbing up and down just ahead of him, and he followed it until came out at the other side of the wood, and found themselves on the banks of a charming little river. A small round boat like a tub, lined with pink rose leaves, was waiting for them, and into this they both jumped. Oh, cried Eyebright, jumping up and down with delight. The fairies are out today. Look at them. Purple, pink and white ones. And you'll upset the boat if you don't sit still, interrupted the king. He felt cross because he could not see the fairies. Let me have the oars and I'll take you down the stream, he said. You need not do anything of the sort, said Eyebright, for this is the boat the magician gave me and it always takes you wherever you want to go. So they just sat in the sunshine and floated lazily along, dabbled their hands in the water and made their sleeves as wet as they pleased, and they caught at the branches above as they passed under them, and they leaned over the side and stretched after everything that grew out of reach. And in short, if they had not been in a fairy boat, it's very certain that they would have tumbled into the water several times before they reached their journey's end. Presently, the river widened out into the big calm sea, and after that, the boat quickened its speed and took them across to the middle island in no time at all. For the fairies know well enough that nobody wants to dawdle about in an open sea when there are no tadpoles to catch, and no trees that sweep their branches down to meet the water. When the boat stopped, they found themselves on the edge of a shore covered with sea lilac and yellow poppies, and wonderful shells that sang without being put to anyone's ear. And just a little way along the beach was the magician's cave. There was no doubt about it being his cave because over the door was written in square tablets, this is the magician's cave. Besides, the whole cave was dug out of a solid almond rock, and of course any other person's cave would have been made of plain rock, without any almonds in it. Come on, said Eyebright. The two children walked along the beach and knocked at the magician's door and went in. Some people might think that a cave on the seashore would be full of draughts and jellyfish and wet shrimps, but this particular cave was just like the nicest room that ever belonged to a castle in the air. And the wonder of it was that whoever went into it found the very things he had never had and always wanted, and none of the things that he always had and never wanted. So Eyebright immediately found a beautiful storybook with a coloured picture on every page and all the sad stories squeezed between the happy ones so that no one who read it could ever cry for a long time. While the king found the inside of a clock waiting to be picked into pieces and an open pocket knife with a bit of firewood lying handy and a full rigged schooner ready to be sailed and they both saw the dear old magician sitting in his armchair and smiling at them. He was dressed in a long cloak that always began by being a green cloak, but changed every other minute to a different colour, according to the mood the magician was in. And as he was always in a nice mood, whether it was a sad or a merry one, his cloak always managed to be a nice colour. On his head was a high-pointed hat with crackers sticking out of it and a pattern worked all over in caramel and preserved cherries. And he wore furry fox gloves on his hands to keep them warm because he was not so young as he used to be. He had been practising as a magician for over a thousand years, but he did not look very old for all that. He was what might be called pleasantly old 
for he had soft white hair and a curly white beard and a pink complexion like a schoolboy. That is how a magician grows old when he's always been a jolly magician. Eyebright ran straight up to him and climbed up on his lap and gave him a hug. I've brought the king to see you, she announced, and we want you to be a nice, kind, lovely magician and help him to be disenchanted. The magician stood up and shook hands with the king just to make him feel at home. And the boy did not feel shy another minute and quite forgot that he'd never paid a visit before without a procession of nurses to look after him. You are very good children to call on me at tea time, said the magician. If there's one thing more than any other that makes me feel the aches in my bones, and that's having tea by myself. Now, would you like to have tea on the floor, or shall I call a table? The king, who had all his meals on a table his whole life, voted for the floor. But when Eyebright said it would be far more fun to see what would happen if they chose a table, he had to agree that perhaps she was right. Well, what happened was very simple. The magician stamped on the floor, and a neat little table covered with a nice white cloth walked in at the door, like any person, and took up its position in the middle of the floor. Well, exclaimed Eyebright, I never knew tables could walk. What do you suppose they have four legs for? asked the magician, smiling. My nursery table does not walk, observed the little king. Ah, said the magician wisely, some tables do not know how to put two and two together. Now for some chairs. He stamped on the floor again, and two little armchairs bustled into the room as fast as their fat little legs would carry them. You must excuse their being in such a hurry, said the magician. They've been playing musical chairs all their lives, you see. Now, while you are laying the table, I will boil the kettle. Crockery in the left-hand cupboard and eatables in the right-hand cupboard. So the magician set to work and lit the fire with peppermint sticks and the two children opened the doors of his wonderful cupboards. The crockery in the left-hand cupboard was just the right sort of crockery for none of it matched so it did not take a minute to find a small pink cup and a green saucer for Eyebright, and a big blue cup and a red saucer for the magician, and a nice purple mug without any saucer at all for King Wistful. As for the right-hand cupboard, the little king was overjoyed when he found it stocked with chocolate creams and plum cakes. I am glad, he said with a sigh of relief. Ah, oh, and you don't keep seed cake in your cupboard. Seed cake always reminds me of eleven o'clock in the morning. Ah, said the magician. The gremlin saw to that when they filled my cupboard for me centuries ago. There's never any bread and butter in it either until you've had as much plum cake as you can eat. That was a delightful tea party. The magician did not mind in the least when they made polite remarks about the food and told him that his cream cakes might have been kept a little longer or that his chocolate creams were not quite so soft as some they'd known before, but they hastened to add that his tea was the nicest tea they'd ever tasted because it had only a grown-up amount of milk in it. So he would have rather been a cross ma magician if he had minded nor did he raise any objection when they walked around in the middle of tea and took a look at the picture book or whittled away the piece of firewood or danced around the cave and shouted because everything was so nice. And after tea, there were all the magician's treasures to be turned out of all the nooks and crannies and corners and left about all over the floor and all his new quill pens to be tried and his clean sheets of notepaper to be scribbled over. And when they were tired of exploring the cave and had eaten as much plum cake as they wanted, the magician saw it was the right moment to begin telling them really true stories. And as he was a magician, 
of course, his true stories were all fairy stories, which, as everyone knows, are the only true stories in the world worth believing. But even the stories came to an end at last. And then both the children remembered at once why they had come to see the magician. And now it is time for all little children to go to sleep. Good night.